why am I here? What's my purpose? Why was I born? What's God's message? In I had to go through two divorces, uh, almost four narcissistic relationships to figure out my worth. I'm not living a life to satisfy people anymore. I'm not living a life to impress anybody exactly. because I have the right of freedom and happiness and to make choices. Yes, I made a mistake in choosing my partner, but so what? Why do they teach us we're not allowed to make mistakes? Gladiator's special guest today, Dr. Sarah Al-Madan. Al-Madan, yeah. Hello. You got it right, first time. I know, but you know, again, being dyslexic, and I know uh, you are dyslexic, I keep getting things wrong. But that's normal. Expect it. If you're dyslexic, expect it. You know what it is? It's, uh, first of all, welcome. Thank you. Audience, a lady I admire, I heard her speak a few months back, and she just, I was about to leave the audience, and uh, she just grabbed me, and I stood there, I thought, I need to interview this lady, so... Special guest, thank you so much. She was late by 45 minutes, which is quite normal in Dubai. I, I, I had a meeting I could not ditch. I so tried, I tried, I trust me. So <laughs> now you know me, you can never ditch us. Yes. So uh, we are. We have been promised a second session. At the summit. Are you getting this on video? So you can I'm hold it against five me. Five million You're videos. holding it against me. Absolutely. We've contacted I'm here. Definite. What? Done. <laughs> Done. I'm definitely coming back, 100%. So welcome. Thank you. Um, I actually was reading your kind of CV and you told me it's best actually not to read CVs because you, you need to connect. I knew we yeah. got to connect anyway. But I was just like, you started your own business at 15, you're Emirati, a approximately 68 and a half tattoos. 79. Well, you got out. I just got one recently, 79. I want to know the story about tattoos. <laughs> okay. I don't need to see them all. <laughs> no, okay. but... So um, please tell us, you're, you're an Emirati. Okay, what was life like? Are you born in Dubai, born in Sharjah, Abu Dhabi? Because I know you connected with the Chamber yeah. of Commerce of Sharjahs. I mean, you were yeah. born in Sharjah. So, no, uh, I was born in Dubai, and then I was raised in Ajman. Okay. And then I moved to Sharjah when I was uh, assigned a board member in the government, in the Chamber of Commerce of Sharjah. And what was the upbringing like? Because somebody looks at you, they never think you'd be an Emirati. And I know that you speak half of women and... Confidence. I speak for humans, not just women. But but the funny thing is that society packaged me as someone who speaks to women, which is great. But I speak to humans, everybody. Pretty. Yeah. I went on a tantric course in Benabit bit West here. Okay. And, uh, before I went, I, I phoned up the organizer and said, how many women and how many men? Because that's really important. Yeah. Because, no, there's beings. I love it. Like, there are beings. What well, there is beings, right? After the course, I realized we were all beings. <laughs> but before going, I want to know, what was the proportion of men and women? But that really doesn't really matter. No, it doesn't matter. Because without this, we're just a spirit. We're energy. Yeah. Well, see, that's right. Digital clock, alarm gone off. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So things like this happen. It's never happened before. I was a bit yeah. nervous. I'm like, what's that ticking? <laughs> yeah. <Was> that ticking? <laughs> so um, what was it like being brought up as an uh, Emirati? Well, look, I'm I'm blessed because I am half Emirati, half Bahraini. So I'm blessed that I had uh, both worlds. Part of me was open, which is the Bahraini side, and then the part of me, which is a bit more conservative, was the Emirati side back then. So growing up, um, I wasn't in a strict household. So my parents were a little bit open-minded, but they valued culture so much. Um I have three siblings, and it was obvious for my parents to see that I was the black sheep in the family. Would be really so yeah. not similar to you. Not at all. Like if, you're the youngest, oldest, oldest. So if you look at my sister, you look at my brother. I'm like you'd feel like I'm like Latino, and they're like typical Emiratis. You know, I, I look completely different. I act different, but it's it's not because um, it, it's not because I don't value what they value, but it's because I bought my ticket to freedom out of. Uh, the box of culture and society expectation. So you felt you were in a box. Yes. So this this is freedom. 100%. When did that? When did, when did you realize or, or chase freedom? Uh, you, you were with an open minded parents. Yeah. So you weren't boxed, or you felt it in society. Yeah. No, I I was I was not boxed, but I was also boxed to a certain extent because they valued culture. They valued what people would say. They care because look, Arabs come from a culture of guilt and shame. So whatever you do, I'm Iranian, absolutely. same thing. You feel it, right? Guilt and shame. Everything wrong, you should be shameful. Anything you do, you should feel guilty. So 
and we're not exactly the most optimistic people. A hundred percent, we're not. Sadly, we're not. But but this is part of culture, you know. Um, I never, when I was young, I never understood why my family did certain things, why they cared about certain things, why they acted in a certain way, just to um, receive validation or seek validation. What made you start thinking that? You know, there's, there's people who accept. Yeah. Any question. I, I, what do you think honest, was that trigger for you to start thinking, hang on, differently to everybody else? I think um, everybody told me when I was young, I was an old soul. So I, I, I don't know what triggered it, but I always like questioned it since I was young. But I feel like the moment I had my awakening, which I completely shifted my mindset and I was like, enough is enough, um, was when I hit rock bottom. How old? Uh, that was 2013. Yeah. No, 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 no. I was always a curious spirit and my parents always knew there was something different. But in 2013, when I hit rock bottom, I had a business partner of mine that stole all my money. And then at the same time, I was going through a divorce. I was in a toxic relationship and everything at that time didn't fall into place. Everything was going downhill. And that's when I started questioning everything. And instead of like, I'm, I'm so blessed, alhamdulillah, that instead of being bitter, I became better. Instead of saying, I hate life, I hate people. I was like, the, the questions that I asked myself during my, me losing all my money and going through a toxic relationship was, why am I here? What's my purpose? Why was I born? What's God's message? In and then I realized that I went beyond why did they do this to me? You know, why did they hurt me? Why did they victim, feel? Yeah. Why am I a victim? I went beyond that to like a bigger question, a bigger vision, where which is like, who am I? Why am I here? And that was the beginning of my spiritual journey and my awakening. And that's when I decided to erase everything. Erase everything, not as in my experiences. Erase everything as who I am, who they told me to be, how they told me to be. And I wanted to discover who I really am. Meaning, Society, family, culture. Did you have a sense of responsibility to your siblings because you were the oldest? Did you feel you were a little bit more chained or locked down because you had younger siblings looking up to you? Um, I Yes, but at the same time, I always had a leader uh, personality. I always had this leadership personality where I led by example. So I wasn't there taking care as in like, they're useless. I need to make sure they know everything. No, no. I give them the cuddled. No. I give people the freedom to grow. I give them the space to make mistakes because we all have the rights to make mistakes. But as Arabs, they teach us that failure and mistakes are like bad. It's Saeb in Arabic. It's shameful. Nobody should find out anything. But then I realized that why should I be embarrassed of failure when failure is the biggest and best school in life? You know? So I never... I don't think it at the time we're going through. At the time, yeah, no. the coaching part is to say, what's the lesson I'm going to learn from this? 100%. The way out of it. 100%. But when you're in it, because lots of people are listening, think, I'd resonate with this. Yeah. But everything's miserable. Around. Yeah. Well, it's life seasonal, right? We go through yeah. winters and springs and summers. Yes, that's true. But also, um, something to understand about failure is that if you sit down and you are like, oh, they did this to me. They took this. They, 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 they. they. And you play the blame game, you'll never grow or learn. Because it takes two to tango. Where did you go wrong? What did you do wrong? What didn't you pay attention to? Forget them. You cannot change them. You cannot help them. You cannot heal them. You cannot change the situation. This is just extra stress on top of the stress you're going through. Yes. Leave people aside. Where did you go wrong? What happened to you? Where did you learn? What did you learn? So the minute you shift from blaming to self-reflection, that's when you actually learn from your failure. So how long did this process take from you recovering from the bad part, business partnership yeah. and then the marriage. Do you mind if I talk about it? No, of course. Okay, I'm you, I'm married. Was something out of love or was it something that was... No, marriage was out of love, but I was young and it was a very toxic relationship, uh, very narcissistic. And when, when you're vulnerable and you're young and especially when you're an empath and you have a good heart, you think... You should just take advantage of it. Hundred percent. You think everybody's good. When you're when you're bad, when you you're think an optimist, everybody. you see everything. Yeah, it's it's like I always say this: when you're a thief, you think everyone's a thief. You know, when you steal, you think everybody steals. When you cheat, you think everybody cheats. But when you're a good person, you think everyone's good. 
So it's like, I don't have the mental capacity to think like a bad person. That's why sometimes I get tricked by bad people. You know what I say? I say, I'm not smart enough to be a crook. 100%. I don't know. Really, or lying. Yeah. You got to be so overly smart. You got to be vile. You got to be evil. I'll get caught. So I'll be a terrible evil okay. thing. Yeah. yeah, exactly. By I'm that. the kind of person behave when you say things like that. So, and we'll, <laughs> because we'll hold you to that. That's Tattoo's question. So, but I'm a kind of person who parks on a yellow line in the in the UK called double yellow line. I'll get, I'll be the first to get. Something in the universe tells me I don't get away with anything. So yeah. I'd rather stay on there. No, but I, for me, which by the way, this is good. This is very good because that means you're a sane person. You're a good person. Yes. Imagine doing things, bad things, and not feeling any guilt at all. It's like you're a sociopath, right? A lot. Trust so me. So, interesting in this um, environment was frowned upon. Was it just? You have the support of your parents. Okay, so did you have children? One, ma- one, one child, one boy. I just have one baby. Um, of course, culture taught us that divorce is shameful, and uh, that divorce is frowned upon, and there's a stereotypical view about women who are divorced, especially women, that they're useless or they're used now. Nobody wants them. They come with baggage. But um, to me. Again, when I was like sitting through my whole awakening journey and my process, I, I was like, if religion is okay with divorce, culture is not, I'm not. So are people trading their belief for culture? They're trading their religion for culture? It just doesn't make sense to me. And then you become a hostage to your culture. But then I was like, I don't get it. My mother has a best friend who um, was married, is still married to a very toxic man. And because of the toxicity and the negativity and how down she felt in the relationship, she got cancer. And when she got cancer, and she was very healthy, they checked her. They're like, we don't even know where this comes from. It's not even in your family or genetically there uh, existing. So when I looked at her and she had cancer and during her cancer journey, it was not there for her. She's a strong woman. She got over the cancer and I told her, why are you staying in this marriage? Obviously, the cancer comes from like an emotional emotional oh. place. You're holding, suppress, you're suppressing. And she's like, I can't. What will my family say? I have a daughter. I have this. I have this hostage. No, she-, uh, she was in her 30s back then. Yeah. And then she got over cancer. They, she was in remission. They told her she's okay. But because she was still with that man, she got cancer again. So I, I hate seeing a strong person dying slowly and giving up on life and an, an opportunity to be free and happy. She's still with us. She's still with, she's still with us. No, she, she's, still, she's still struggling. But it, it breaks my heart to see someone struggle and not be free, not to, not to taste life the right way, not to live freedom, not to enjoy life the way they should, or even find out what's there for them in life because culture told her that. Yep. Yeah, because culture told them that, because their families told them that. So it breaks my heart. And when I was going through my divorce, that was happening to her. And I said, never in a million years will I settle just because I have a boy. If I have 10 kids, I'll still walk away. Because I have the right of freedom and happiness and to make choices. Yes, I made a mistake in choosing my partner, but so what? I'm allowed. He's got a beautiful boyfriend. Yeah, but I'm allowed to make mistakes. Why, Why do they teach us we're not allowed to make mistakes? I teach my kid, you can do any mistake you want because you're either it's either a blessing or a lesson. So make the mistakes you want. And this is something I was not taught. Because you've done it with the right reasons. Right? You went yes. into it with a good good faith. You yeah. Like you, you make mistakes as long as you're meant to do well. Yeah. Right? And then celebrate your mistakes and move on. As long as you're not hurting people, your intention's good. It doesn't matter. Do mistakes, learn, grow. This is the, see, the thing is, we are here for a short time and this. 3D experience. So. I, I'm an old soul, trust me. Yeah, I, can... <laughs> I feel like I'm 800 years old. You have to wait to be in the 50s and then start <laughs> talking like this. Ah, oh, well, hit me earlier. But no, it's it's like... This is, is that a, a blessing? It is a blessing. It is a, 100% it's a blessing. Because um, now if you, if you tell me, Sarah, I'll, I have a magic wand and I'll take you back into your teenage years or your 20s again. I'll say never, ever. I love them but I leave them behind. Never, ever. I love where I am today. I cherish every experience I've been through, good or bad. Some of the bad things I didn't deserve, but oh my God, it made me the woman I am today. And this is a lot of personal development. Were you in personal development from a young age or you got into it 
2013. Well, I'm a, I'm a, how did you, I'm a star seed. I'm a, I'm a light worker. I feel like some people are born with these things in them, with these, like, they're stardust. So you don't read books. You don't. I'm dyslexic. What books do I read? I listen to Audible sometimes. Me too. Uh, I I don't because you know when you have dyslexia, it's hard to keep your attention unless you're really into something. You're a doctor. That's an honorary honorary PhD. So you 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 thick. I'm what? <laughs> like me? No, no. Actually, I, I think I'm quite smart in certain things. <laughs> so it wasn't that you 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 have a doctor in something. So honorary. No, that was a manifestation actually. Um, I dropped university second year because I had a business at the same time. So I had to make a decision and I took the hard decision that my parents didn't allow me to take. I took it and I went on a pathway, but, um, I dropped university, but I always felt like, ah, can I go back? You know, even now in my thirties, I was like, should I go back? But my, yeah, I can't, but, but I, but I love my, my parents so much and I just wanted to make them happy. But then I remember I met a life coach and she told me, what is your dream? I said, my business. She said, whose dream is it for you to go to university? I was like, my mom and dad. She's like, that's their problem, not yours. You have your own life, your own dreams. I was you had business. That was, I was a fashion designer at that time. And uh, yeah, so when I dropped university and I was like, and you know, I believe in manifestation so much. So I was once meditating and I was like, wow, you know, my father told me without that paper, that graduation from university paper, you will go nowhere in life. But I am going in so, to so many places in life. I'm extremely successful. With that paper, you're always going to be changed to a company, right? Because yeah. you will be an employee. Now you're an employee. Right. Isn't, that, isn't that the system? You're supposed to be sucked in and brainwashed to be in. The cookie cutter factory you're supposed to come out of. I refuse that. I, I broke out of that and um, I'm happy where I am. But then I was like, wow, you know, I... I wish I could make my dad and mom's dream come true, but I don't want that dream. They're still with us. Yeah, of course, yeah, yeah. And if I went to them, they're, they're proud of me. Yeah, now they're, so you all the they're, not, they're not proud of all my decisions, but I kind of taught my parents something about life. I told them, love people for who they are, accept them for who they are. And instead of judging, give space for loving. And, you know, and once you love somebody, you enjoy them. I said, mom, dad, I might be here one day. Next day, I'm not. Accept me for who I am. So the minute you remove my judgment, you have so much time to enjoy with people and love them and enjoy their company. Life is short, but when you're judging them, you build that barrier, you build space, you build distance. Why? Just because they turned out to be different than the way you expected them to be, but that's your expectation. Why do they have to match it? Yeah. Did you ever get educated outside? You have like, you have always within this small well, I, I studied in an American it, school, American well, university. It wasn't in America. No, no, here. Some was, people listen to me, well, it's okay, she was rich and she went to America, but you never did. You were always here. No, I, I, I was I'm not I was not rich. I be, I beca- made myself rich. I became rich because I worked hard for it and I and I deserve it and I own it. So you're worthy of it. I'm I'm worthy of it because I worked so hard for it. So I, I don't come from like uh, rich money because a lot of people give me this, you know? Oh my God, you're Arab you know, in America, I remember I was sitting down in a meeting once with a lot of people before my speech and 50 people were in the room and they're like, you're Arab. You probably like swim, swim in, uh, sorry, bathe in the toilet and like golden bathtubs and you have barrels of oils. And I was just sitting there. I looked at the girl and I was like, are you guys like the Simpsons? You know, because, yeah, <laughs> because that's what's, what the media shows us America is like the Simpsons. But I said, this is what you see on the media. We're not really like that. So I get that a lot, oh, rich kid, privilege and all that. I was not privileged. I came from a normal household. I built myself up. I worked for it and I'm worthy of it. But people who judge you for that and call you um, privileged and, oh, she has it. From her fans, lucky. I hate the word lucky. She's lucky. These people have a poor man mentality, which means they don't believe they can ever make it. So they drag scarcity. people down. So that's uh, yeah. yeah. So... Going back again, I'm going to keep going yeah, back go because there's so many questions I'm going to ask you. So, fashion, fashion is a very expensive business to get into because you compete with all these things. Not really, it, isn't it? No, it's a very, it's a very fashion. If you know the cost of clothes you're buying for three thousand dollars, nine thousand dollars, if you know the cost of that, as in like the fabric, stitching it, boxing it, shelving it, you would not pay all that money for it because you're paying for a brand, not the production. So, fashion. 
Fashion is easy, but becoming a brand. No, it's still easy. Tell us how you... Still easy. Um, if you have... And an... why do you have a partnership? Why do you do it by yourself? No, I, I I was a partner for a while until she stole the money. Then I continued the journey. Why did we have her in the first place? Because she was my best friend. And we just, like, two girls. I was young. She's young. We just started together. But, um, no, to start a fashion brand, um, a lot of fashion designers, what they do is they look at other brands and they copy the same C-minus homework and they, you know, turn it around in the industry. If you have an identity, if you have a personality, if you don't look at others and you build your own system and you become motivational and inspirational on your own instead of copying other people's work and you have a story, no matter what your business is, if you have a story, that's how you go far in life. So it was not expensive, to be honest. It was very easy. But um, I, by the age of 35, so that was 20 years in the business, okay? I realized I don't even love fashion. I just did it because I'm a woman and everybody told me that's what a woman should do. So I was cornered into an industry of business. So you created So you were the designer? Yeah. yeah. The designer. I, was, I was good at designing, but I don't enjoy it, you know? So I, I felt like I was cornered into an industry just because I'm a, I'm a woman. And I, and I was like, I don't even like pa- uh, fashion. I don't have a passion for fashion. But I did it because I thought that's what a woman should do. 20 years to realize. And then I was like, it was making money. It was good. But I was like, I'd rather take that time and energy and do something I love and make money out of it. Because that's what success is. Doing what you love and making money out of it. So how do you find it? Because so many people are looking for the passion. They're looking for something they love. How do you find yours? Um, okay. I, th- I think finding passion is a process. All right. Um, but first you have to differentiate the difference between passion and a hobby. Hobby is what you do when you have a free time. Passion is what you do when you have a free time. When you don't have a free time, even if you can't do it, you don't even know why you do it. I'll give you an example. Um, I once went to a ballet uh, show and I met one of the ballerinas backstage. And she took off her ballerina shoes and I looked at her feet and I was terrified. No toes, broken finger, displaced finger, bleeding uh, toes. And I was like, I looked at her and I was like, why do you do this? Because I see, I see your feet. Why do you do this? She looked at me. She said, I don't know. That is what passion is. She doesn't even know. She just loves it. As she loved it. She loves so it. Forced. She was not forced. She's like, I don't know why. I just, like, I can't live without it. Even go with her. Look at my feet. I don't know. I just can't stop. That's what passion is. A hobby is something you do when you're free, when you're bored. The challenge is when you turn that passion into business, right? Some yeah. people are so passionate they forget to charge. Yeah. They're undercharged. They don't value themselves. And a lot of it goes back to self worth. Yes. Okay. So somewhere along the way, you've had self worth. Yes. Right. So you knew your boundaries. You knew your values. And not, 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 not early enough. Um, working program. Yeah. I had to go through two divorces, uh, almost four nar- narcissistic relationships to figure out my worth. But you have to also understand that if you're self reflecting, why? Okay. So let's see this. Um, Sara, four narcissist partners in a row. Yes, they're bad people. They're narcissistic, obviously. But let's leave them aside. I'm not going to blame anybody right now. Me. Why am I choosing narcissists? So, yeah. So, so, the answer? so growth comes when you self reflect and you don't look at what people do. It comes from childhood because I always, um, I grew up thinking that love is hard. Love is something I had to do so much to receive. I had to do so much to be accepted and to be loved. I was scared of being left and abandoned. So all of that made me feel like love is hard and I have to give up so much to be worthy of it. It's not a narcissism, right? Uh, me too. <laughs> because I had to, so I could survive. Yeah, it's the yeah. standard, right? Yeah. With what you find with narcissists that they're very good at giving you love at the beginning. Love bombing. Love bombing. Yeah. Is that what attracts you at the first? Um, like, love is so hard. Yeah. So, that's what I've been searching to do all this to be strong. True. 100%. So, two things. Number one is when you meet a narcissist person, before they even love bomb you, you will feel such a strong connection. Why? Because I have trauma from the past and I'm used to narcissists when I grew up. So when I met the narcissistic person, I felt like I'm home. I felt like I've known him before. 
I felt like we're connected and this is made and written on the stars. But the truth is, no, it's not. The truth is that this energy, I've been exposed to it when I was young. I was exposed to, exposed to it growing up. So I feel home because it reminds me of something I've lived before. It's not because I've, I'm connected. It's not the stars. It's not, it's not God. It's not the universe. The universe has brought you to this. No. Not this energy. No, this shitty energy feels familiar and, and feels like I know it because I've lived it before. And That's it. find that if you meet somebody who's not a narcissist, you get scared. People... No, no, you'll be scared. You won't believe in it. You'll walk away. You'll be bored. It's so good to be true. Stop. Yeah, it's so good to be true. It's it, There's something. Who sent you? <laughs> no, but narcissists, like, okay, so so this is the two things, right? This is what narcissists do. You feel connected automatically it's because you're traumatized from the past and you're used to that energy. So it's, they say it's better a devil you know than an angel you don't know, right? But then the narcissist before even approaching you, you've been bait. They've been studying you, watching everything you do, reading about you, researching you, and they'll ask you questions to get to know you. And once they have that information, they create a fake persona. So, and they present it to you and you look at it and you're like, God, that, there were similarities there. No, that's everything I wanted in a man. How? Then it's definitely written in the stars. No, they studied you. They preyed on you. It's interesting is that I'm a fixer. Ah, okay. Welcome to the club. Exactly. And as a fixer, people think that I can fix that. Yeah. I can fix that narcissism, but the damn things are narcissists you can't fix. No, it's uncurable. It's uncurable. That was a sad part. No, it's uncurable. It is a sad part because if you're saying you're a fixer, that means you're a light worker as well. Right. So... You know, a person of light and feels they can fix people, not not from a place of ego. It's because you love humans. You love humanity. It's all about love. It's, it's all about love. Natural. Love of life, love yeah. of light, love of yeah. air, existence, human beings. Man, everyone keeps telling me, take off your Bob the Builder's hat and stop trying to fix men. But the thing is, they don't understand. I'm not putting a Bob the Builder hat. It comes natural. I love human humanity. I love fixing. I love helping. It's genuine. So, but... You got to understand one thing. You cannot be fixing people while you're breaking yourself. That's called self-betrayal. Yeah. yeah. But that's called self-betrayal. How can you say I'm a good person if you're not good to yourself? How can you say I want to give and help and support the world if you're not doing the same for you? There's something wrong. You think that, that you're a power woman, right? And it's a compliment. It's Thank a compliment. you. You think if you meet a really nice guy, you won't be able to handle you? No, when I meet nice people, I don't. Right. Uh, when I meet a, a yeah, yeah. Like, when I meet a nice man, I don't connect because I'm so used to a certain type of man. But now recently, because I've done um, I've done hypnotherapy, I've done therapy, I've, I've been doing a lot of work on myself, and I've done spiritual healing that changed my life. Spiritual healing is unbelievable. Now I don't look at men like that. Now I don't choose men like that. Now when I see a narcissist, I swear you can ask my friend. When people walk into the room, I'm like. I smell an arc, you know, I, 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 it's like I've healed my spirit. What was broken from childhood, I healed that. And after Very healing that, too. yeah, and after healing that, I don't take that bullshit anymore. I don't have time for that anymore. And um, now I don't, I do not, I cannot stand people who are narcissistic. I cannot, I don't, I have like such a filter that I don't take bullshit anymore from people. And now I am starting to realize that I'm not attracted to narcs anymore. I'm attracted to normal people. But I don't think you are. No, I am. I am. Normal. No, what do you mean? I don't think you you will leave somebody normal in a heartbeat. You will what? You will leave them. Why? Because I think you're looking for outstanding. No, I'm not. I'm not I should live in an outstanding life. I do. No no normal normal will bore you. No no normal as in like normal spirit. Yeah, uh-huh. Elevated not spirit. Issues, yes. No issues. Someone who has done the work, someone who's awakened. I think they are that. Yeah, there are. There's a huge movement. There's a huge spiritual spiritual awakening. Uh, there goes my dyslexia. There's a huge spiritual awakening movement that's happening in the world. A big one and a big shift. So you don't worry about your son and his relationships in the future? No. I, my son, him. he's a very old soul like mine. He's like a 37-year-old man in a 7-year-old body. And you talk to him, no one, no one can bully him. No one can hurt him easily. He has a shield of light that I trained his mind to open in front of him and he sees through people, but he's also vulnerable. Close to, close to, close to. Best friends. 
best friends ever. And he comes to me. He went to school today. No, he's finished. He's done with school. He's done with school. School's finished. Yes, yeah, school's finished. He's done his final exam last week. Okay. Yeah. His mind got another two weeks to go. No, no. He, he's done early, but he loves to go with me whenever I do podcasts. That's why he's sitting outside because he always he has something to say. He's like, Mom, if they allow me, I'll say something. I was like, awesome. Next time we'll do yeah. So he always comes to support. He's such a loving soul. He's so gentle, but he's very, very wise to the extent I, I take advice from him about men because he's a pure spirit. So he's genuine. So he sees through people. We're not pure because culture, society, education system, it, it, it distorted our pureness. Children are pure. So when I meet somebody, I go like, mom, what do you think? He's like, mom, he's a good guy, but I don't think he's good for you. I'm like, how do you know that? He's like, I don't know. I just feel it. And I trust him because he has a pure energy sensor. You know, long time. Trust him, but you listen. I listen all the oh, time, wow. all the time. I was in the car yesterday. Funny, she had an eight-year-old son. Yeah. And I, I, I behaved in a certain way. I like compromise in the situation. Yeah. Just not just for an easy life. And we're driving along. Uh, to, we're, we weren't somewhere. I was on the way back. And the daddy, he's eight. He said, Daddy, you might, might share something with you. I went, okay. He goes, Daddy, when you did that, you compromised. I said, yeah. He goes, wow, why don't you matter? We sat. Yeah. Sorry, he goes, don't you be a man? I said, no, I'm the boss. This is the way you go. This is how you should be, like it or not. I looked at him. I said, you know what? I'm so proud of you. That's amazing. And he was like looking in his beautiful blue. Oh. Yeah, I was, I'm so proud of you. It's not, you know, I'm, I'm in my 50s, right? I'm mean, telling your dad to man up. I love He's it. Good. I love it. Well, but does he have a point? Absolutely. He was totally right. And when I was compromising, I was thinking, this is not what I should be doing, but I just do anything for peace. Yeah. I didn't want to oh, you're like that as well? Mm. It's like I, sometimes I remember, this is the point. I remember once I gave up my whole company that I've created with somebody. Just I gave it to them for free. Not, yeah, confrontation, but I just wanted peace because it was too much for me. And my peace of mind is, is you know, priceless. But, but still it's wrong because I betrayed myself because that was mine and I should have handled it in a different way and still had peace at the same time. But we we're all... You know, we're all beautiful beings in, in work in progress out there. A lot of listeners are in business. It's an entrepreneurial yeah. program. Also inspired because you, yeah. your story, my story inspires me. So fashion, you left two years ago. or you? No, I left uh, when I was... You realized fashion. 35, yeah. almost two years ago. Yeah. Okay. So, three. You're dead. So, um, you had other businesses before or you, no. you just... Um, but... Uh, 13 years into having the fashion company, I started a restaurant. I sold it. I in Dubai. Dubai, yeah. I was called Shabar Bush. British Emirati concept. Um, I sold it and then I took a lot of my money and I invested in tech. And then I started to realize that my passion is technology and public speaking. Like out of all, out of the nine companies I own, the most thing that feeds my heart is being on stage and speaking to people. Because I feel like I'm adding a value. I feel like I'm giving back to the community. There's so many ways of giving back. You can do charity. You can give away things. You can help people. But also, if God gives you a voice and a platform and you use it for the better of humanity, that's also giving back. So that's that's where I love and what I love to do the most. But it probably isn't the most possible. Uh, no. Exactly. No, I, I, I go through this. Yeah, I do you. Yes. See, that's what passion is. It is. I, yeah. I was the other day. I took. I actually just come back from Maldives. Okay, I'm going in three days. Oh, read them. Four days. I'm, so many islands. <laughs> well, I'll go to. Uh, I'll go to Aldriga. Have you heard of Aldriga? No. It's a small island, 300 meters across. It's amazing. Okay. So, um, so I just go by myself without their family, and I was thinking, why am I doing this? Does it earn me much money? I, I lose every month. Uh, I, I don't have anything to sell. All I'm doing is just. Helping people. Yeah. I, I've got no products. You know, and the, there's always a reason why people are on stage to sell them something. Yeah. Back of the room. Sell. I don't have anything to sell. I just want to help people. Yeah. And then got in a car to take me from A to B. And the, and the guy driving me said, I watch your videos and I'm going through the winter of my life. And I've just lost my mom and I've lost my business and this, 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 this. And your videos keep me going. Oh, wow. Four days I've been thinking, why am I doing this? And then that one comment made me think, that's right. 
you're doing the right thing. But I'll tell you something. I used to do public speaking for free, completely, pro bono, until a year, two years ago. No, to, until 2019, I stopped. Why? No, but, but I'll tell you why. It's because being a good person, I thought that if I charge money for doing good for humanity and the world, which is public speaking to teach people and help them, then it might be bad because I'm doing something good and taking something in return. And that was such a wrong mindset. There is nothing wrong. There are people out there selling crap to people, killing people, hurting people's health, and they're making money out of it and they're happy. Why can't I make money while I help what, humanity? What, what message are you sending to the universe yeah. if you're not charging? Yeah. Because you're not worthy. There's no balance. There's no and balance. Of what I found out, when you do it for free, they don't appreciate it. No, it, it forget it. You pay, you pay attention. No. The fact is, when you inspire someone, yeah. you want them to go home and take action. Yeah. If they don't appreciate it because it's for free, they're not going to do anything. Yeah. No, sometimes they pay the organization that you're speaking in, but not you. So they still value it. But, but, somewhere along but you're not getting anything. But it's like, why? It's not, it doesn't make me a bad person if I charge for doing something good for humanity. There's nothing wrong with that. So switch the mind. When you're selling, absolutely agree. When you're selling clothing, when you're selling fashion, you're selling products, yeah. you put a value to it. Yeah. What about when you're pricing yourself? Was that easy or was that tough? That was very hard, okay? And uh, because I was like, I just don't know how to price myself. I don't know. But that comes from a place of like low self-worth at that time when I started. Thanks, sir. Yeah. It's because I don't value myself. And when my manager was telling me, we'll charge this much, I was like, she's like, but you're worth it. I was like, yeah, but no one will pay. But that comes from self-doubt and, and low self-worth. But thank God, not there. I left that that place a long time ago. I burned so the bridge. working on this. Every single day, every this doesn't stop. The brain doesn't. Stop. Oh, life isn't cool. I'm a student. Every single day, I go to school, right? But um, I remember my ma uh, now. I know my manager's like, let's charge this much. I was like, no, you go higher than that. Now I know my value. Now I know what kind of value I add to the world. I know what I can bring to the table. And there's nothing wrong with that because I remember the media and society shames you if you're a good person doing something good and charging for it. They shame you for it. Not anymore. I'm not. Um, I'm not living a life to satisfy people anymore. I'm not living a life to impress anybody. So I said it's cultural. Yeah. Right? In America, you celebrate. In England, they, they put you up to knock you down. Oh, wow. Here, if you if they have fun knocking you down. Yeah. Um, in, in England, if, you, if you're successful, they key your car. Oh. You can never leave your Ferrari on the side of the street. Somebody can call it a key. People aren't inspired. Yeah, they take photographs. No, but but also, um, you said in in America they celebrate you, and London they would you say they they build you up to knock you down, knock you down. I think here, um, when people found found out, okay, this is this is how the scenario here is. This is the Arab culture. You're making you're taking money from helping people. Shame on you. She should feel guilty. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. Shame and guilt. And this is how the Arab, the Middle East, you find is. When you do you resonate more with foreign foreigners, expats, or more Emiratis? So it doesn't make a no, it doesn't make a difference because it, I I know people culturally the yeah, Emiratis are struggling because of that. I know a huge amount of Emiratis who are struggling because of the culture. They want to be themselves. They want to live an authentic life. They want to experience freedom of the spirit and the heart, and to be just wild and free. But at the same time, they don't want to hurt their pa their parents. They don't want people to talk about their parents. They're, they're, they're hostages. Now, the funny part is the UAE and especially Dubai is is all about freeing yourself. Because if you look at Dubai as, as a person, okay, and our, our if you look at our rulers and our leaders, they are very open-minded. They lead in a very futuristic way. They're very open. They're very for, uh, forward-thinking and out there. But at the same time, they respect the culture. They 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 apply some of the cultures that they think is applicable to them, and that's how it should be. Culture is a box of chocolate, out of your flavor you like. But it's times. Yeah, I cannot. It's peer pressure from the grave. I could. What what happened? A bunch of people sat together. They created rules. What's hundred years ago, and now we're still living by them. While we live in a society that's different, in a timeline that's different. Look at our life. Look at the technology. A lot of things from the past don't make sense anymore. Why am I satisfying people in the grave? Why can't I create my own culture? 
Why can't we we do that Can again? You speak on stage in Arabic as well as English. Yes, both. But I'm way better in, in expressing in English because of dyslexia, because I, my education was in English. So I find it way more easy to express myself in English. But I speak Arabic. Do you yeah. think some corporate companies are a bit scared of you speak on stage? Because you talk about sleep. Yes. I mean, I've I've been booked to speak at so many corporate events, but these corporates, these companies that book me are very liberal in their organizational, how do you say, culture, the culture of the organization. They're very liberating. They they have that human flow and leadership in the company. But if a company is like uh, conservative. conservative managers, if I come there to inspire their, their team to live the life they want, they leave the company. Exactly. Yeah. I used to, I used to uh, have my own business in the UK, and when Tony Robbins came, I used to shut the company down, take literally 50 to 100 staff from Manchester yeah. to London, and then I didn't realize that half the people left afterwards. So it was inspiring them but that's, to actually but, have their own business. But they're not trees. They're supposed to leave. Yeah. They're supposed to grow. It was costing me yeah. a lot of money to get them down, shut the company down, invest in tickets, and half left. But I mean, maybe I should but, do a different but, type of training than inspiring them to be self-employed. Look, I think you were the reason for another season for them. Ten years later, they come back. So I'm working for you is the best thing that happened to me. Yeah. But a funny story. We're on a train. My ex-wife and I were on a train. And we got a text message from our general manager saying, uh, hide the database until I come back after the weekend. Oh. I was like, what's this about? So we went, when we landed in uh, London, we confronted her. She was like really aggressive. Do you think I'm going to trust me? Blah, blah, blah. She was supposed to send that text to one of the member of staff. Was going to steal our database. Well, hey, now, now that's that, that's not that's not helping no, people. That, that's stealing. Yeah, and then yeah. come back. She left. Oh wow! No, no. I, for me, I have straight guidelines. I, I'm nice. I'm sweet. I'm kind. But when I walk in the office, listen. This is allowed. This is not allowed. This is respectful. This is not respectful. You cannot breach this. You cannot do this. I lay the grounds, and I'm and I'm very firm. Okay, but at this, but it's fair, firm and fair. But at the same time, they know I'm loving, I'm kind, I'm funny, and all that. It's like they understand there is these du- this duality in, in this person. They yin and yang. What I get from you is you're very clear with your boundaries. People very. Know where they stand. In the past, now I'm very clear, and I don't step down. Yeah. So um, your day, you you're in the office, but you're an investor. But you're an investor, passive investor. You're an active investor. No, active investor. Uh, actually, no. I've had I've had deals where I was a passive investor, but. Um, so my day is the nine companies, when I started them, I have partners in each and every one. I love working with people. So in most of the companies, I, we built it up. We hired great people to manage the business and the manage and the company is moving and doing everything on its own. Um, I don't micromanage because that's not only bad for my health, it's bad for my mental health and it's bad for my employees because they'll be dependent on me always. And then they can't breathe. And then I can never find out what their potential is, right? I need to believe in people. Um, so I don't micromanage. I I built it up, give it legs, and now it's walking. Uh, the only companies that I'm still a full-time CEO in are two. So that's my full-time CEO. You might share. Yeah, yeah. One is called Hala High. It's an entertainment tech company. Um, it's, like, it's like a one-stop shop for everything celebrity. If you want a video, shout out from the celebrity you love dedicated to you, saying whatever you want for you, they do it for you. It's a local based. Local based, yeah. And But we did a global- Celebrities are worldwide. Worldwide, yeah. And um, you can buy merch from them. You can buy anything related to celebrity directly from the celebrity. And brands can work with the celebrity directly without a middle- Now, I wouldn't say a middle man because when you work with celebrities, they're middle- uh, Chains. Chains, yeah. yeah, right. So it's like removing that and taking the hassle away from the connection between the brand and the celebrity directly. Yeah. So that that I'm a full-time, full-blown CEO every single day. See, directly it helps your brand. Yeah, I mean... Because you are a brand, you are a celebrity. Yeah. The thing is, what I love about it is it's all about my expertise. It's the entertainment industry. It's marketing. It's working with celebrities. I have a company. It's over, I think, you now almost 11 years old. It manages celebrities as well. Uh, tier A, Tier B, Tier C. Um, in Hollywood. So we, we, I, I have that background. So it was easy for me to just come as a CEO and invest and have my partners with me and do that. So dealing with lots of egos then. No? Dealing with lots of egos. Uh, ego is not my amigo. And if you have ego, you don't work with me. With these celebrities. Yeah, no. 
If they have ego, I deal with the manager. If the manager has ego, I don't work with them. Talking about managers, what made you choose? Do you have the same manager you had at the beginning? She still no, 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 no. You moved. I, I, my, uh, I switched so many managers because one was using me, one was jealous of me, and they wanted to be famous as well, competing. It's like I don't get it. And then one was uh, toxic, one stole money. But right now, I have a manager. It's been almost a year and a half. She is one hell of a woman. It's fine. How do you choose her? She, she's a friend of she me. She manager in PR or no, just manager. No, no, she, I have a publicist in the U.S. and my entertainment lawyers in the U.S. and my agents in the U.S., but she is my full-time manager all over the world, but she's based here. She was a friend of mine. She comes from a great PR background. She had an agency back then. She managed talents, but then uh, she went through a downtown in her life uh, where she shut down everything, and she was she was seeking growth spiritually and all that, so we're aligned. Um with the, our mindsets, but she's done an, an impeccable job, impeccable job. She doesn't leave a room without like closing the biggest deals and getting whatever she wants out of it. So you speak, as you're her sole client or she has other clients? So I'm her sole client. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you travel worldwide to do these yes. talks? The talks worldwide, yeah. She doesn't manage my public speaking. I have a different manager for that. She manages my brand deals, my image, um, all these work that I have like regarding my brand. Yeah, Amazing. and what you're wearing now is your own design. No, I stopped designing. And then, and then, well, no, you designing fashion, maybe. No, I just let it go. The Turn hats it. is is what's what's about the hats. I love hats and fedoras. I collect them. So I have so many of them. Okay. And okay, two things. I love them, and I love it. It's part of my style and my identity. Number two, when I have a bad hair day and I couldn't wash it or blow dry it. Exactly. I and I feel the same. You should. Yeah. I'm gonna have a bad hair day. It's a killer. So, um, yeah, I was gonna go with it. So, yeah, tattoos. Yes, tell me about it. Don't you think, like, before you tell me all about the tattoos, don't you think you're gonna get like 75 and go, what the hell was I thinking? No. Do they mean something? Of course. I never got a tattoo because I saw a celebrity. Like, it's not like, oh my God, the celebrity has a butterfly. I want a butterfly. So, when the tattoo journey start? 15 years old. My first tattoo with my best friend, I did it. And um, and that was a mistake we did because we, no, we never, I never told anybody. We both Especially never. Especially moment. Yeah, but then they found out that I was too late and it was getting worse and worse and they gave up. But we got, my first tattoo was a mistake with my best friend. Why? Because we just wanted butterflies because all the celebrities had butterflies. But after a year, you look at it, you're like, it means nothing and it's there forever. Now what do I do? But then I, shifted my mindset to let me use my body as a canvas and tell my story. So every tattoo is either a lesson in my life or a blessing. That's it. That's why now if I look at it, I don't go like, oh my God, it's there forever. What am I going to do? I look at it and I go like, I remember that day. I remember that day. I remember that lesson. I'll never forget, you know? So it's just a connection. And in the end, we are spirits, you know, with a human experience. You go to the same tattoo artist and you trust the uh, I have two that I always go to, but I but I also every time I travel around the world, I get one. Yeah, seventy nine. It was seventy eight a while ago. Two days ago, it became seventy nine. It must be tiny ones, right? No, I got I actually got a huge snake on my. Uh, on Which my, country was that? It was here. So, so like you, people collect fridge magnets. <laughs> yeah. This is my fridge magnet. So when you go to when you go to Toronto, you have the whole CN Tower. Or Oh, it has to mean something. Why the hell would I? I don't, I don't to my Khalifa tattoo on me. I don't so, That was my next question. So every time I travel, there's a something in my life, a lesson. And I go like, okay, since I'm right now in, let's say, where? Germany. That lesson, I want to get it tattooed in Germany. In Germany? Yeah. So you find a tattoo artist. That's hard. Oh, because I love people's energy and I want rough. different energy. Yeah. Halfway through, you're thinking, this is not the right tattoo. It, it went wrong as in like ugly. Like I was like, that's not what I saw on your Instagram account. You're really bad at tattooing. But then you laser it 10 sessions later. Those as well. You've had... I've removed three. three. Yeah, I've removed three. Still painful after 70 odd. Is it painful to you? Where you used? Uh, it is still painful, but you're numb to the pain. Does that make sense? Because <laughs> I don't have a tattoo. <laughs> So is it like toothache? <laughs> oh, it's like when you go get your blood test done. Mm -hmm. And the first but, day... Yeah, but that's one injection. Going on for ages. 
I mean, yeah, but your your body gets numb after a while. So you just get you get numb, and and I, I don't use any anesthesia because it's not even good to use anesthesia with tattoos because your anesthesia swells the area you spray it on. So if they design something, you change this, and and then the swelling goes down. You're like, why is my eye twisted to the right? You know, so it's it's a bit dangerous to do anesthesia. You have your own face on your body? No, never. Your eye. I was giving an example. <laughs> Somebody's eye. The evil eye. I think it's the evil I, eye. I do, I do. I have a... Do you believe in ancient civilizations, alien? I mean, you know what? I've, I've been listening to Joe Rogan. Yeah. And, uh, British... Uh, I don't remember his name. British um, journalist. Yeah. Studied this. He's talking about the universe that, that died and destroyed. Like, that's where the pyramids come from. Yeah. Where we have such high... Uh, beings and then you kind of disappear then it's yeah. new generation of things. true so if you think about it people what, what does science tell us so far how many we've lived how many years 10,000 years right but they have discovered human fossils that go back to billions of years so this existed everything was here way before us we're not the special ones right but I believe in Aliens, actually, no, I will not call them aliens because they're the real deal. We're the new ones, so we're the aliens. So I believe in aliens, ancient civilizations. I believe in all these things. That's why I told you in the beginning, I'm a star seed. Star seeds are people who know that they have star dust in them, like a bit of DNA from everything in the world in them. So this is uh, this woman is a Palladian woman. You know, Palladian. You've never heard. Yeah. I've heard, but so Palladian is a civilization from Pleiades. They are in Orion's uh, belt, the seven sisters, the stars. So we say universe. You're not talking about just past life here. You're talking about no, universe. I'm yeah. talking about outside, not only past life here. So the, Pallade the Palladians came to Earth to guide humans and to teach them how to be one with each other, how to teach them love and unity. And like they, they, they come from a place where they there is oneness. So, yeah. And once I was meditating... And um, during like a ceremony, and I I don't know why I just saw in front of me while I'm meditating in my mind a Palladian woman, and she told me I'm Palladian, and I come from the Seven Sisters, and and it, this was a journey with nothing involved. It was just bre breath work and meditation. And then when I when I saw that, I knew that I was connected to something like that. So I got her on my own. Feel that, GMC. No. You should. <laughs> Why are we talking about this here? <laughs> because that does send you to another universe. I'm telling you. I feel, I, look, I feel like. You don't need that. You just need meditation. Yeah, I feel like um, it's all inside of you. You can release anything. There, there, There's a kitchen inside of us with so many recipes and ingredients. And there are so many juices in the body you can release, whether it's happiness hormone. Anxiety hormone. This, 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 that. It's great. Yeah, it's like you choose the juice you release in the body, right? Whether it's endorphins or with the cortisol and all that. These kind of things, reaching that level um, and, and seeing things and feeling things and attuning to a higher frequency. If you always need psychedelics to age, then you are not my... You need tools. At least sometimes it's good to just. It's good. I'm yeah. not. I'm not saying. I'm not saying it's not good. So for some people, it yeah. works. I heard about that. But I feel like all the ingredients are inside of you. We just need to know how, how to mix them cool. and release and tap into it. Yeah. So where do you find to do meditation? Where do you find time to do all these courses? I don't micromanage. Remember, I work three times a week. That's it. Three to four times a week, seven hours on those days, and the rest of that, I'm traveling. I'm enjoying. I'm living. I don't work hard. I work smart. Huh? But the thing is, I think you have to work hard and smart. But I think you work in focus. You, you, do, you do work. Don't say. No, no. In the beginning, to to reach your goal. Hard on yourself, right? You work on being an amazing mom. You work hard. You are, you are just focused. Hundred percent. But but after you built your business, you don't want to work hard anymore. You want to work smart. I'm going to challenge you. This challenge. I think if you do what you're passionate about, you're not working hard. You just enjoying yourself yeah a lot yeah right so it never stops second thing is i like i like growth so yeah. as soon as i've achieved something i, I want to achieve more which led to my next question yeah. about your thoughts about money okay 
when is, is it enough money? What was your education about money? What do you think of money? Is it enough money? Are you motivated by money? This it's a trick. Money tends to be a trigger point. I did not have a good relationship with money for so many years. I thought people who had money were evil. Money was evil. That come? I don't know. I have no idea where it comes from. I, I really, I, I genuinely don't know. And some people told me it's from a past life. I'm like, I have no idea. <laughs> but you had past life question. I did. I, I tried it. It's unbelievable. I had an Akashic reading as well and all that. But um, I haven't seen that part in my past life regression. I've seen others. Yeah. You know, the money part. How many past lives in two? Two. There. Uh, one was in the Pharaoh's days and one was in the 1950s. It's, it's a crazy story. One day when we sit together, I'll tell you about it. But um, I don't know where it comes from, but I know my healer told me it comes from a past life. And she told me if we go deeper into the past life, you, you'll figure it out. But um, I never had a good relationship with money. I made money, but I never, it never stayed. It always left. It's because I was not in peace with it. I was not even attracting it. I was giving it away. I, because when I got married twice, I was a financial provider. So I was always giving it away. It's like as if it's not valuable. And, but now... I switched everything. I love money. Money is such a beautiful thing if you can use it to do the right thing. Money is such a beautiful thing if it's going to help me help my family, if it's going to help me give my child a better life, if it's going to help me pay for my healing, uh, help people in need. Money is such a beautiful thing, and money is not evil. People are. Money doesn't create evil people. It projects what's really in you. Magnify. So if you're good, you become better. If you're bad, you become worse. You know. And it took me years to learn that. So now... I have a very healthy relationship with money. I attract it, it stays. I, I manifest it, and I didn't have that before. Being a fixer, being kind, want to help people, and in the position you're in now, I get you get a lot more people reaching. Yeah, they, I want this, I want that. Sorry, I got this. This is. Do you find it easy to say no? Or do you say yes to everyone? No, I, 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 I think it's been three years, four years. I started saying no. What a liberating feeling it is, you know? I couldn't say no in the past. I was like, yeah, sure, whatever you need, take, take, take. Now I learned how to say no. And I have boundaries. And um, Was it a pain or losing a big amount of money? or No. Emotional? Because mine was, mine was, I lend this guy millions, ran away. Yeah. And um, today, seven years later, and I, he's free, he's moving on, moved on. But I lived with that decision of saying yes and no, no. Because it yeah. um, for seven years. So that's where yours came from. Okay. Now, mine was just understanding that in order for me to love myself, I had to set boundaries and I had to step, put my foot down. Because if somebody wants to hurt my kid, I will say no and I will kill them. If somebody wants to take something from my family, I know how to say no. It's just when it comes to me, I can't say no. But that shows you that you don't value or love yourself. So I switched the whole game with healing. I love myself more now. I say no. And sometimes if I can help, I'd help. But if I feel like I'm taking on someone else's problem, then I don't. Because my peace of mind, I value it as well. And as much as I can, I give. But it's, it's, you're not a Christmas tree. You're not supposed to make everyone happy, you know? And all the time just staying there entertaining everybody. That's not what life is about. And if you leave this world not understanding that you cannot call yourself a good person, you cannot call yourself a pure spirit and a kindled spirit if you put people above you. Lesson not learned. You need to put yourself first and then put people. It cops then you can have people. Hundred percent authentic. And you're still giving. It doesn't work. Yeah. yeah. So um, now you're still investing. You're still looking at investing in yeah. companies. Is there a threshold of minimum start or? Startups, you want to get engaged in involved in companies. Yeah, I invest in one company on average a month. Yeah, uh, but I'm a passive investor. Got it. I, I... Got it. So, so what is this called? This is called work hard or work smart. This is work smart. This is getting my money to work. But it's I still work very hard at this of giving. Yeah. Yes, I'm working. Good. Here's the thing to answer your question: is that yeah. I'm working harder. But that, but that, but that's what you're supposed to do. Hey, let's be late. That's why I don't. I don't. Late start. But it's fine. It's never too late. You're still young. Yes. It's never too late. No, you're still young. When I said work hard, I meant at work because I don't feel like 
we were born to burn out and work hard and abuse ourselves and lose ourselves and go through mental exhaustion. I don't feel like this is the purpose of life. Life is about enjoying living. Yes, definitely working. But that's why when it comes to me, my family doing what I love, I work hard. But when it comes to business and all that, I don't burn myself anymore. And business is an effect of your life, doesn't it? So if you the business is a certain extent, your, your someone in his lifestyle, a certain extent. But but let me give you a small example. No, never. No, no. I failed. I, you know how many times I lost money and shut down companies? I failed a million times. But it, when I when I say work hard or work smart, I'll give you a fast example. Let's say you want to be a fashion designer. You can go get a loan of 300,000K, rent a small store, hire six people, open the full shebang, have the proper way, textbook way of having a fashion thing, buying the machines, having your own workshop, having everything under control, and then that's working hard. Or I can just open an Instagram page, open a website, get a cheaper version of the license, which is re online retail, find a factory, work with a factory, and place orders and go through them. Work hard, work smart. I will still make money. I will still make millions. I will still have to do a lot of work, but I don't work as hard. Like not physically. You're not selling your time. I, I'm not. Thinking, yeah. No, I need this. I need this. Yeah. So if somebody came to you and I said, look, invest in my company, what kind of credentials are you looking for? Oh, God. You have no idea. I don't invest. Me and my partners, we don't invest in great ideas because you yeah, people. Exactly. I invest in humans because if you have a great idea, but you don't have the backbone to hold it, someone with more money will come with the same idea, do it better than you and crash you down. You have to have resilience as an entrepreneur. You have to have a certain spice in your personality to be an entrepreneur. So when we invest, what we do is we create a boot camp and we take five entrepreneurs on a boot camp for like a couple of days. We put them through hardship and survival and we look at their behavior. Whoever is aggressive, angry, walks away, bosses people around, I don't want to put my money in you. I put my money in the person who is a leader, teamwork, helps, calms people down, is, is still in the storm. The person who is creative about how to find solutions and is just there for everybody. Leadership. That's the person I invest in. How long is this book? Have you hold it monthly? No, no, no. Monthly, or... No, we hold it every six months. It's three days, okay? And we created it in our warehouse. It's in the States. So... The point is that your idea... I know you have a your company. Yeah. I, I have two companies in the States. Yeah, yeah. Which, which is the other one? The, no, the other one is a tech company as well. Tech. No, we, we rented a warehouse and that's why we do our boot. And we don't torture people there. Yeah. Just FYI disclaimer. <laughs> You're in San Francisco? No, no, in Los Angeles. I, I, stay in, I used to live in Glendale. Yeah, yeah. So, so I love LA, but I couldn't live there. Like nothing is like Dubai. But uh, basically, you, uh, just one message to all the entrepreneurs out there about investors. Your idea, I'm pretty sure, how many people are we? Seven point something billion people are in the world. Your idea has been thought of one way or another. It's not innovative. It's not new. Somebody out there have done it, thought of it. I need to look at who you are. Because if you don't have the personality to keep up with that idea, if you don't have a 360 a innovative uh, ecosystem around you in your mindset and who you are, I don't put my money in you. If you're weak, I don't put my money in you. If you're um, all about management and control and have ego, I don't put my money in you. I'm, I, I put my money in leaders. I put my money in game changers. I put my money in movers. You invest in running businesses or main startups? It doesn't matter. Um, it doesn't really make a difference. doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It does, I, I, for me, I... I Last time I've invested, um, recently I've invested in a biotech company. Um, the man was in his 70s. I don't care. I don't care. I, you're, you're still alive. You're breathing. You're happy. You're doing what you love. I love it. Um, the thing is, look, it depends. If it's a startup, I have uh, different expectations. If it's a running business, I have a different expectation. Um, we're very, very flexible as well because... Um, once, I remember once we invested in a company and we promised X, Y, Z amount of returns in two years and with a certain interest as well. So we went into it. My partner, two, two years passed. The promise was not fulfilled, but I know there's potential in the people behind the company, in the idea itself. They just needed more time. My partner was like, no, let's exit. Let's cash out. Let's do this. Let's do this. So my partner exited the transaction. I stayed in the transaction. For two more years extra, 
Then I cashed out and we sold the whole company for multi, multi millions. So you never know. You got to have the human elements in you and be flexible with your expectations. You help with the exit? Yeah, we do. Sometimes, sometimes. Yeah, but mo most of the entrepreneurs we invested in, they know exactly the game. They know how to do it, when to do it. We sit on the, we, I do have a board seat in every company I invest in. Not, not a board seat that controls everything and have a say in everything, but just to give extra advice when needed, just to be there, just to give like a push when they're feeling down. Like, you know, me being the fixer coming in as a board seat, just to, to be there for everybody so they can feel like I didn't just dump my money and left. I believe in you guys. I'm there if you need anything. You yeah. pinch yourself sometimes. Pinch? Pinch yourself. Well, this is reality. This is real. This... Nothing is real. Do you think all of this is real? Nothing is real. Well, this is an excellent dream. It's not a dream. We, what's real, what the truth is, we're energies and we're just energies from one source. I'm to say, do you live in gravity? Yes, I do. I do. No. I, I do. Around this table, looking up to me, I'm only in my 30s and it's where I am, where I, I do. Where I was, where I am. 100% I'm thankful, I'm full of gratitude, but also I don't take it for granted. They say success is not bought, it's rented, and the rent is due every day. So I know every day I have to go out there. I have to do what I have to do to keep up with the image that I'm building for myself. Yes. And I, as I said, life is short. Enjoy. See, I don't take life so serious because as I told you, nothing is real. You know, we're here for a short time to experiment life. Think of it. You are an energy, right? Your soul. Without this body, without this experience, how would you know what love is, what hate is, what anger is, what taste is, how to yeah. touch a flower? We needed this vehicle to experience life. Don't take life so serious. Don't take everything so personal. Enjoy. You're not here to create business and make money and be a machine. You're not here to produce children and be a stuck at home and raise them. You're here to live. So if you would ask me, what's my biggest fear in life? My biggest fear is to exist and not to live. That's it. Oh, we look back and think, I didn't show my shoe. Never. Never. The future and the past don't exist. And now, it's all about the now. This came from lots of, I guess, lots of pain. Hundred percent. Right? Pain is the biggest teacher ever. It either makes you or breaks you. You thought the opposite. Yeah. So, what do your siblings think of you? If I had to go to them, I said, describe your sister. What would they say about? It? Rebellious. Still. Wild. I have a tattoo that says "rebel." Rebellious, wild, funny does whatever she wants, lives the life she wants. She's wild. She's free. But she's also loving and kind. You ever going to slow down? Never. Never. Come on. My biggest inspiration in life is death. Do you work out? I do, but at home. I go, to, I go to the gym when I can, but because I am raising my son and I spend a lot of quality time with him. If I can, if I can choose between, if I had two hours off, if I had to choose between my son or the gym, so I choose my son Take yourself to the gym. I do sometimes, but I choose my son because I can work out at home. <laughs> I have personal I have a trainer. You have a personal trainer. Uh, yeah, I can do it at home. You, no, at home, do you have a personal trainer? No, 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 not personal trainer. You can still push yourself by yourself. Yes, I watch videos online, and I, I, knowledge is for free. It's everywhere now. I bought one of these mirrors that you can switch on, and the mirror turns into a personal trainer. What? It's amazing. So what happened was, I got. I actually have a personal trainer. Okay. And the reason I like you is just entertain music. Not a particularly fantastic personal trainer. Wait, I just don't get bored. Yeah. I got sick and tired of moods of personal trainers. Yeah. So I thought I'd buy this machine, it's a mirror. And then you push the mirror and it tells you, and you can choose any personal training you want that specializes in yoga, this, that, that. Joking, right? I swear. What do you mean, like a human sized mirror? It's a proper mirror. Huge mirror. Huge mirror, but yeah, human size. And you see, like, but the trainer. The is about this big. It's a mirror. It's like a hologram thing. Yeah. Wow. On. And then they go, good morning, what do you want? And then you go, I want uh, yoga 20 minutes. And yeah, but, want... but then Robert is always in the same mood. He's yes, happy. Always happy and doesn't talk to you, <laughs> doesn't ask questions. Doesn't bother you with his personal yeah. stuff. Yeah, what I found out was personal trainers, I was paying them to coach them. Yes, you're the therapist. Uh, yeah, and I'm like, what <laughs> is this? I, 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 no, can we can we talk about me now, right? Yeah. The mirror was perfect. Where did you get it from? Uh, go sport. Where? I'll send you. I see. Please send me. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, yeah, yeah. yeah. Buy mine. Yeah. <laughs> Are we doing a deal right now? No, no, no. It's, it's, um, it's funny, though, because um, sometimes the Wi Fi crashes, right? Yeah. So you. 
my God, that's amazing. Really. And they up- updated all. What if you fall in love with your female personal trainer? You can't. Well, why do you could actually? You can talk. talk. <laughs> <laughs> they just listen to you. Like, they just listen. So it's what men want. Like you back. A beautiful woman. That's that's what I'm, yeah, yeah. And it's available. <laughs> I just switch over button. That's exactly. Oh. I miss her. Switch on. Flexible. Yes. <laughs> Any color. Oh, oh God. Absolute pleasure. Thank you so much for having me. You know, we've been an hour. And I missed my appointment. You did? Worth I have. You. I'm so sorry. But thank you so much. I enjoyed it. At least one. I owe you another one. Part two, yes. It's been an honor. Thank you so much for having me. One question. Tell me. In your busy diary, why do you say yes to this podcast? Because you had no idea. How did you, what was it that made you say yes? Because you could have easily said no. So many people want to speak. Because I asked myself that question. I wondered, what was it that attracted me to say yes? Because when Sydney, your team member, approached our team, he was so kind and so generous when he was speaking. And usually, people when they approach me for podcasts, they're like, "We want her this time. Is she available?" But Sydney was very human, and uh, the way he spoke about you, and the way he explained things about you was just beautiful. It's amazing. Yeah. He just missed Sydney. He left by he, Yeah. Such a so, sweetheart. Yeah. Amazing. So he's the reason I was like, I want to do this. If, if this guy works with you, I want to do this. Thank you. Yeah. Somewhere along the way, you because he was speaking to your team. Yeah. You get to hear about it. So yes. did he bypass you? No, no, he spoke he, he spoke to the team and to me at the same time. Yeah. But then but then usually when I like the person, I tell my team, I got it. You know, don't worry about it, I got it. But then yours, when he spoke about you, I was intrigued to know more about you. But I'm the type of person that doesn't read about people. I told you earlier. Judge me. I don't want to have a judgment or a perception when I come to the room. I want you to, to give me all of that live. And I am so honored I'm here because you're such an inspiration. Your story, your energy, your, your aura, beautiful all over. the same. Yeah. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you. Thank so you so much. much. Thank you, everybody. I hope you enjoyed it as much as well. See you next time.